Okay, hi. Uh, my name is James Leone. Today's October 1st, 2011, and I've got some findings that I want to share, or at least um, an answer. I think it's probably probably going to stick, but um, uh, the amount of assurance I have is pretty limited. So... Um, <laughs> Uh, that, that is to say, that I'm going to go through all the evidence that I have, and then, you know, you can judge for your, for yourself. But at the end of the day, I'm going to, um, I think I have a pretty major finding. So, uh, I guess I'll just start off. So, um, I right now I'm working up the line from an ancestor that was named of, of, of some people I'm doing this tree for. They aren't my blood relation, but they're their family. And um, the ancestor that I'm working back from, her name was Fanny Lewis, and she married a guy named Joseph Joe Joel Anderson Johnson. Now, the, the conclusion I'm going to draw, of course, is going to apply to anyone that's really it's a descendant of um, Monroe Lewis's father. Randolph Lewis, but I'm going to work my way up there first, to, so we have some a point of reference to know what we're, we're talking about here. So, um, Fanny Lewis was the daughter of Monroe Lewis, and where do I start here? Um, right. Okay, so I'm too far ahead right there. I'm going to get this other pack. Sorry about the delay, but I just want to make sure it's right here. Yeah, I think this is going to work here. Okay, so Fanny Lewis was the daughter of Monroe Lewis and Anna Ellen Starnes. Okay, and the way I got that piece of information is by examining a birth certificate. I've already gone over this with the Starnes presentation, by the way, but I'm just going to do it again. I, a death certificate. I don't have a death certificate for Fanny Lewis because she died in 1975. I was able to get a death certificate for a sister who was named Rossi Pearl Lewis and married a Robert Hartson Jeffrey. And she's buried in Shepherd Cemetery. It's again back connected to that, that line. We're also where Joseph Joe or Joel Anderson is buried with his wife Fanny. And in that death certificate it has her as the daughter of Monroe Lewis and Anna Ellen Starnes. Get that clear, I don't know, but it's about as good as I could probably get it. So, instead of going up the Starnes line, we're going up the Lewis line now. Okay? And so, let's see, now for Monroe Lewis, a lot of papers here today because this is a very complicated subject and I hope it doesn't take too long but it probably will. For Monroe himself, I to see, do I know when he died? He died in 1919, so I should have a death certificate for him. And God help me if I didn't print it out. <laughs> oh, wait, he Was it something that just wasn't very eventful? Let me look in this other pack over here because I think I'll have. We'll probably just in the. Starns pack? Am I? No, I don't have a Starns pack yet. <laughs> well, <laughs> what I do know is that there was only Monroe, one Monroe Lewis of the age. <laughs> Uh, that he appeared, and he's in the household of Randolph Lewis and a wife, Lucretia, that's said to be Lucretia Williams, and I'll discuss what evidence has been presented to make that assertion as far as I know. Um, so there, it, there he is in the 1850 census, and he's got a father named Randolph. Now, in the 1860 census, he's not living with... <coughs> his father, although his father is still living and married to a woman named <coughs> Nancy. Someone else came up with the last name, I don't know how, and it's in one of these postings. 
I may be able to present it, but that's not really the focus of what I'm doing right <coughs> right now. In this situation, he was what's called a bound boy. Um, <coughs> I guess it means that these people were picked as uh, the adopted family. I'm not sure what bound boy. I probably should have looked it up. <laughs> but one ended up being embarrassed by this. But assuming he was the natural child of Randolph Lewis, <laughs> okay, now we're working back on Randolph Lewis's um, <coughs> census records. And um, here's 1860, 1870. In fact, the limit of working back, of course, Randolph Lewis is 1850 when he's married here. And his oldest child is indexed as a wiener, but I'm going to tell you that that name is Warner, and he was um, born, you know, probably around 1840, you know, 1843 by this math here, so Monroe Lewis probably married Lucretia um, around 1843. Now, now we get to the interesting part, because when we go in, when I go into the um, 1840 census and I look for a Randolph, see Randolph, he's kind of young here in the 1850s. It's got him as having been married for only seven years. He would have probably been in whatever household he was in. He's back at Smith uh, Smith Division, Smith County, Tennessee, where Starnes was. So that's expl that explains how Monroe Lewis met Anna Ellen Starnes. They're in the same geographical area around the same time, but that's a different subject. And back in 1840, his wife-to-be would have been 15. He would have been 25, but I don't expect to see him as a head of a household in the 1840s. So, let's go to the 1840s and take a look. And I guess we're going to be working backwards here. And I'll start out with what I have, and then I'll go into some other stories. And then I'll point one thing out before I get to the other stories to say why this is actually worthwhile to pursue. And, be, and that piece of information will probably be the strongest argument for the conclusion I'm going to draw. And then there's some very important implications with regard to the conclusion. So <laughs> it's a complicated path to get there, but stick with me. So in the 1840 um, census, when I look at for Lewis's at Smith County, Tennessee, I only see two households. I see one for Mary, listed as Mary W. Lewis and a Joseph D. Lewis. But just to give you an idea of the quality of type of um, thing we get out of the 1840 census, it pretty much looks like this after you print it out. And you might get a little better look, actually, if you print it out than if you view it on screen. And, uh, and so down here at the bottom is a Mary Lewis. And it's going to be a little sharper for me than it is for you when you're looking at it. And what are all these little ones and all these in these columns? Well, these are the number of males under 5 and, you know, different date age ranges. 5 through 10, 10 through 16. Uh, God, 15. <laughs> 15 through 30, and then 30. Yeah, it's really hard to read even from this vantage point. If you zoom in, you can read that, but their handwriting doesn't get any better. It gets kind of smudged from the from the pixelation. So, working from 1840 back, you're, you're in a bit of trouble. And if the census taker's writing wasn't all that hot, as you can probably tell from here, it really wasn't. It wasn't clear and crisp and so even though I could kind of make up some of these names Smith and maybe Holden and Davis on occasion some of these are just <coughs> little tiny things okay now there's another record besides Mary Lewis that we just looked at and these records are actually two pages long and I'm not gonna and some nice people have gone about to do their best to transcribe what they've seen and sometimes they'll probably go by the index, and the indexers just look at these and try to do the best. And we can see here that there is some of the, yeah, the last name looks like a Lewis. There's a D in the middle. That's pretty 
prominent. The indexer thought that was a Joseph. Well, I'm going to say that's a Randolph. And so I think I found them in the 1840 census, but I wasn't confident enough to say that until I actually had gotten to um, do a lot of other things with this. Now, when you get to the 1840 census, and because you're dealing with a situation in which none of the names of children are being told, you don't really have a story to go by. You can try to work your way backwards, but in our case, we have uh, a Randolph, Randolph Lewis that, well, wouldn't have been married in 1850 unless, of course, all of his children moved out and his second wife was, um, and, and that was his second wife, in fact. So that means you have a total of three wives. I don't think that's really true. <coughs> and I'm not so <coughs> entirely positive that just because of the scribbling I say me, I think looks like uh, Randolph Lewis actually is. <coughs> but I'll try to explain why I think that would be the situation um, if it was. Okay, so you got to try to find a story. So you're looking for, like with the Potes, I happened to find a, a story about how the Pote family arrived in McCracken, Kentucky, and they were there early, and they met Father Durbin on the horse, and he, yes, we're Catholic, okay, and then they had services at the Pote's house. Or I might be confusing that with the Griefs, but I think it's I think I, I think it's the Potes. Or they're, at least they're mentioned in there. They're mentioned early on, and you know I was able to use that. And that wasn't that much. I've seen a lot more and a lot more detail provided. And so I started looking around for just the name Randolph Lewis. And I guess I'll point something out right now. That if you look at, you go to there's two places that between the two of them, if the record isn't there, then pretty good chance that no other records exist. So I'm not saying Randolph Lewis's uh, record is not anywhere, but what I am going to say is that the name Randolph Lewis is so rare that if you're able to actually identify who, if anybody asserts who his parent is with any kind of authority, you know, then that's probably it, because there was really, I'm going to tell you right now, there was only one Randolph Lewis that was born around that time. There was a Rand Randall Lewis <coughs> who married, and I found that through the International Genealogical Index, that married, it was from New York. I don't know, he actually had a marriage in um, Virginia, but he had a whole other set of children, and those are discussed here in this little thing. And She's saying he's a Randall. On the IGI, they're calling him a, a, a Randolph a really big thing. So I had to eliminate from the process of elimination. But going down the list of, of Randall Lewis's in the International Genealogical Index, there, there's only one, and that's... The, there's only two, and that's the father and son Randall Lewis. They're mentioned in the Lewis genealogy that I, that I found. So I'm pretty sure I got them. <laughs> is the right ones, and I've got, but this is the best proof I, that I have. Not to say that between the Mormon Church and Ancestry.com, every record that's ever happened in the world uh, that could involve a Randall Lewis is in there, <coughs> but um, I'd say it's a very, very large portion. And out of all these records here, um, you there's a, there's only one appearing in 1810. All these other ones that have date ranges that fall within the date ranges that I'd be interested in, which would be anywhere between 1810 and 1850, just to see if there's any other Randall Lewis in the world, because I have coverage for, for Ancestry Canada, Ancestry UK, Ancestry Australia, Ancestry Germany, Italy, France, you know, the whole deal. <laughs> um, their mismatches of scanned documents where there's a guy named Lewis Randall. So there, there isn't any of Randall Lewis. Uh, Randolph Lewis. <laughs> Sorry. Um, except for these two. These, those were the first two. Then after that, yeah, there were other Randolph Lewises. But at this time, he was the only one. And in fact, there never really was and I'll get, into the, I'll get into the evidence that I have, there never really was between the two of them uh, 
both of them living at the same time. And how is that? Well, fathers can die and <clears throat> mothers can still give birth nine months later. And I think I'm pretty damn sure he was a posthumous birth. Okay, so Randall, this Randolph Lewis is mentioned in one book, let me get right here, that hasn't been discredited, although I, I found some you know, mistakes in it <laughs> based on some of my findings, but when you have so many people, you're going to expect some kind of mistake in it. But, okay, so basically here it goes into Randolph Lewis, uh, son of Charles Lil Lilborn Lewis and Lucy Jefferson. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and it mentions that he had a son also named Randolph that went west and they stopped there. They don't say anything else about it. There's another source of this is called the Lewis of Warner Hall Family History. And I got this off Google Books and I took uh, little screenshots of the parts that I wanted and got them big and here is the son Randolph <coughs> Lewis and it says he died in 1809 here he didn't he died in 1811 and I'll show you how I know that and um, it says he married his cousin it's not the first time in this line cousins have been married into and they had eight children some of them but they lost sight so they got a man named Lilburn and they mentioned Randolph Lewis Jr. who moved west and they lost track of him so what are we gonna do we have we have a 1840 census that isn't indexed to show Randolph Lewis we have no other records of Randolph Lewis's other ever except for in this family genealogy <coughs> two of them count two of them and Probably it's going to be mentioned in a later edition of the William and Mary Quarterly, uh, where it does go into some of his, his ancestors and draw the connection, but it doesn't get down to, to Randolph and the one that I was able to see. It'll probably be released next year when it's out of copyright. But I did find this little gem right here. This is the abstract of early Kentucky wills and inventories, and that helped me sort things out. <coughs> now, the basic outline is, and this probably does a better job of showing it. <coughs> we're, again, we're just trying to work our way back to first establish that the Randolph we see that was the father of Monroe is the same Randolph in this book. And I have the first point that I have is that there weren't any other Randolphs to, to be anywhere else. So, unless they put him in here on mistake, and I don't think they did. In fact, I have proof that they didn't. Uh, we have the same line. This is the same set of people, and we have a very, very rich family tree. Very rich family tree to go with from here. This is very good news. So, um, let's start with, and I was, I was disappointed in some of the places that I looked for, for resources, but through all this, I'm, <coughs> all these different tests and ways looking at this, I'm very satisfied. So, we're going to start out here. <laughs> if I can get to it. That there is a Colonel Charles Lewis of Buck Island. And this one thing that ain't very good about this book are dates. Although it does give a marriage date, but it doesn't do too well of making the dates clear from what you see on the surface. But it says here that Charles Lewis in 1746 married a Mary Randolph. Does that ring a bell? Yes, it does. Randolph, Randolph Lewis. And October 15th, 1725 through October 13th, 1803 is when she was born and, and died. And they got married in 1746. And then, and I, I had to have the censuses to help me get this all sorted out. Basically, what it says, it ha you know, he writes his will, and he has a number of children, but he does mention in his will that he has a grandson, Randolph Lewis, which would be very, very important. That's an overlapping and connecting <coughs> piece of information. Now, in this early Kentucky wills, these are abstracts, so all they do is they go in there and they get the stuff that's important to genealogists and put it in these books. And for um, 
Randolph Lewis here, who is, um, if I remember right, the Lewis Randolph, of course, would be the father of the, the Lewis Randolph that we're interested in, but the the Lilborn Lewis was a, a son of the Charles L. Lewis, of whom was um, one of the main main beneficiaries of this Charles. Okay, so <laughs> to go back, this Charles Lewis that I, you know, I looked over his will briefly. Who married Mary Randolph was the father of Charles Lilburn Lewis. I give to my son Charles Lilburn Lewis. Charles Lilburn Lewis was the father of Randolph Lewis. The grandson that's mentioned in this Charles Lewis's will. Okay. Then Randolph, the son of Charles Lilborn Lewis, writes his will, and he has a wife named Mary, as in the genealogy there. And <coughs> he names all of his children, but the one person that's missing is a Randolph. But the one person, and there's one other name that's in this list of names that is not in these either of these Lewis genealogies that he's looked at, and that's Robert. There is a Warner. There is a um, a Howell. Those those are the important names that we're gonna we're gonna remember. And um, so what what I figured I'd end up happening by looking at this 1850 census. I remember, keep in mind that this is the only Randolph Lewis this time anywhere in this country by both by by any account of the Mormon Church that's been very judicious in collecting information about um, individuals and putting them in their records from any source found probably many times over and I can't find my census now, which is which sucks. So I probably buried it, tossed it aside amongst all these papers. Yes, there they are. And <coughs> also all the different agencies that have turned their records into Ancestry.com and one from the other have never picked up on this. Uh, the idea that Oh, there he is. There's Warner now. There was it's fixed. So that's that's a very strong piece of the of the information that I have. There's there's nowhere where else to put this Randolph, but where they put them in this book, and they they were tracking the records downwards. We've tracked it up. We've met. <laughs> we have a match. There's no other Randolphs, so it's got to be this way. Um, Now, just looking at this, did, did Randolph completely disappear? Well, he is, he is in the 1810 census in this place called Smithland, and I guess I'll get into that story. Now, in fact, maybe I could approach it from this angle, and I got so many different papers, my god. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to actually articulate what I had in mind to do. <laughs> there is just so much here. Now, in, in Paducah, now this just happens to be a coincidence, by the way. Um, the Okay, I'll just, I'll just start with the story of what happened. So Charles um, Lilliburn Lewis decided, for whatever reason, after he married... Lucy Jefferson, the sister of the president, Thomas Jefferson, decided to go out to Kentucky and settle in a place called Smith Smithland. 
and that's in Livingston County. Livingston County is right over the bridge, the Lucy Jefferson Memorial Bridge <laughs> from Paducah, where a lot of the descendants of uh, where Monroe Lewis ended up settling and having a lot of children. And there's probably a lot of descendants, and, there's, and then there was a lot of Johnsons after that from Joe Anderson Johnson, and um, there was a memorial there for her. And there's a, there's an old book, you know, old, old stories of Kentucky, and maybe I could read that in just a second here. So find it. Yes, here we are. Stories of Old Kentucky. Now, this was written, don't know the exact year, but it had to have been before 1920. And since this was written, the Daughters of the American Revolution has ma have made a memorial for Lucy Jefferson Lewis. So this kind of gives a little bit of context, but this is just, you know, legends of Kentucky, right? Lucy Jefferson Lewis, as travelers on the waters of the Belle Riviere pass <clears throat> between the historic town of Smithland, which is where they settled, and the unpretentious hamlet of Birdsville, few were aware they were within a mile or two of the grave of the younger sister of the writer of our Magna Charta. That's a, he, he should have just said Declaration of Independence. <laughs> Lucy Jefferson Lewis was the sister of a man to whom we owe our national decimal coinage system, our statute for religious freedom, <clears throat> our Declaration of Independence, the University of Virginia, and the Democratic Party. Though she was the was the wife of Dr. Charles L. Lewis, that's Charles Littleburn Lewis. Now they say brother of the noted Meriwether Lewis. I got the sense from the Lewis genealogies they were cousins, but yes, Lewis and Clark. The reason why he knew Lewis <laughs> From Lewis and Clark, Mary Weather Lewis, is because his sister was married to a family member of the Lewises. <laughs> That's why he was picked, in part. And though she was blessed with wealth, culture, love, and family, yet today she sleeps in an unmarked grave in Livingston County. And Livingston County <coughs> is the next county over east from McCracken County. Filled with enthusiasm for then for the then far west, which was Kentucky. The Luce family in 1808, and another counts as 1806, ten years after Livingston County was formed, moved to Kentucky and purchased a tract of land about three miles south from Smithland, and on a lonely rocky hill overlooking the beautiful Ohio River, raised their roof tree, and <coughs> with the Virginia slaves began a home in the wilderness. And yes, they were slave owners. Some say that Dr. Lewis came with his wife, children, and servants, others that he did not come until eight or nine months after the family arrived. But be that as it may, all agree that he was unsociable and moody, okay? And he soon tired of his primitive abode and left, they suppose, for his former Virginia home. Well, there's more to the story than that. <laughs> I'll get into that. All alone with her children and servants in the western wilds, is it any marvel that Lucy Jefferson Lewis should sigh for the happy home of her youth on a luck, lonely rocky promontory where she could gaze far up the river she could sit day after day straining for eyes there might be a broad horn coming with the news of her dearly beloved Virginia if one was spied a servant was at once sent out in a small boat to bring to her <coughs> her long wished for papers but this rare Virginia flower did not survive transplantation. In 1811, she was buried near her new home with only a rough stone from the hillside to mark her last resting place. Only a few short months afterwards, where she, there was enacted by her two sons, Lil, Lilburn and Isham. Now, I have never heard that she had a son named Isham. The most revolting tragedy. Then Lilburn died, and it said Ish, Isham under an assumed name, entered the volunteer army and fell the Battle of New Orleans in 1815. Then it, this is this is important. The other son of the three daughters left on file in the county's clerk office at Smithfield, a writing dated August 29, 1814, conferring upon Thomas Jefferson the power of attorney to recover certain lands for them in Albemarle County, Virginia. 
They subsequently married, moved into other states, which would be Tennessee, and I'll show that. And nothing is left to mark the homestead but a pile of rocks. Three sunken places overgrown in the wildwood show the lasting place of Lucy Jefferson Lewis, her son Lilburn, and his wife. The cold autumnal winds seen through the trees, trop, tops, chat, a sad requiem of the lonely deserted spot. Well, I don't think it's really that bad. But there was some some sadness, you know, I guess, if you go over the contents of these wills, because I just kind of flashed them in front of you, but I didn't really read them. If I could find it. And I did. <coughs> so getting back to the story, and I think I'm going to try to bring over my... Um, Copy Family Tree Maker from Windows and open it up here. Okay. I got it worked out better than I thought it would. Okay. Let's open up Family Tree Maker here. Hopefully it'll be where I was when I left. Come on, come on. This is the program I use. Yeah, okay. So this is the program I use to kind of organize everything. And, okay, so these books have basically said, okay, here's Charles Lilburn Lewis. Don't exactly know where he died. I'll get into, I'll get into why in just a bit. There's Lucy Jefferson who died in Smithland, 1811. We have her exact birth date. And we may be able to get her death date from the from the gravestone that I have a picture of, so okay. Charles Wilburn Lewis and his will, just going over it again, he names his children. And you know, included in that is a Randolph, Mary, Lucy, Nancy, and Lilburn. They were married in 1769, and these dates here I've just, I really should say about, because I don't, I don't have a birth certificate, I don't have a gravestone, I am just pretty much guessing and adjusting as things come in, because I, what I have is a will to tell me who the children are. Alright, so I'm going to change these to about. Now, the Randolph that we're interested in, it, interested in it, in and is the Randolph Senior, not the guy that disappeared into into the West. Um, in fact, all these should be about two, but I'm not going to burden you with that. Just keep that in mind. These are not exact dates, okay? I usually always give 20 years between for the husband to marry at 20 and wife to marry at 18, just as a general rule that works out most of the time, but obviously there are exceptions. Not everybody gets married then, but it's a good general rule to follow if you don't have actual vital records, and I don't. Now this Randolph Lewis, I have him dying between 16 January 1811 and February 1811. And I get that from the will abstract, and the children that I count here, all of them, or most of them, um, I get from his will and or that book, but I think I'm going to be able to say I get it from his will. So this is, uh, Randolph's is the smaller abstract, but basically it was written January 16, 1811, and this is in Kentucky. This is in, um, again, Livingston County, Kentucky. And it was proved, that means it went to court, so... To, what happens is is that the, for the title of the ownership of whatever property the individual owns to pass from one person to the other, um, to go through its legal process, it has to be brought to court. And this is this even goes back to the 1600s in this country, and then they present the will to the judge, and that's when the will is proved. You know, witnesses. So the will are asked, did you see him sign this will? 
they give their testimony, and then there's any questions, and if everything turns out okay, then they prove it. So this will was proved in February 1811, so the general rule is to say that he died between January 16, 1811 and February sometime, maybe the 28th, right? The will lists his wife, his sons Charles, and Howell, and Tucker, which they're calling Tucker Woodson, in these other books. Am I getting that? <laughs> then Robert, and then Warner, and then daughters Mary, Lucy, and Susanna. So I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine children, but I have a total of ten. My tenth is Randolph. The reason why I have my tenth is Randolph is because these other genealogies, one, are saying that there was a second Randolph that they knew of, and they got everybody else right. So why wouldn't they get Randolph? It could be that this is a miswriting. And this should have said, not Robert, but Randolph. But when I look at the ages on his census records, which I've probably lost again, <laughs> here they are. For Randolph, he's reporting his age as anywhere, giving himself a birth year anywhere from 1815, which would be too late. Randolph was dead by 1811. That's Monroe, living alone. There's another time where he says, 1815, but we're close, we're within four years. Here in 1870, he's giving the age that works. That is 60. That works. In fact, he wouldn't be that old. He would have been 59. He's remarried with Nancy. And here he is giving his age as 68, which is probably the most accurate, because if, if um, he was born what's called posthumously, then he would have been born, obviously, as much as nine months after February. So it would have been late 1811, at latest, when he was born. And those last two censuses get him in about the right time. So that works, actually. <laughs> so given the fact there aren't any other Randolphs out there. And so now we've got a whole new world that, you know, that we're into. So the, the basic story is, from what I could tell, is that, oh, let's get back to the contents of these wills, actually, before I get into this, that. Now, Lilborn Lewis here is actually, you know, Randolph had a son named, did he? No, he didn't have a son. There were two Lilburns, and there was a younger and an older, and I had tried to figure out who this was. This, okay, this, yes, the senior Randolph had a son named Lilburn, but I think there's a screw up on the dates here. Okay. I think that either Randolph Lewis, back then they had double dates, and so it would, wouldn't change till the next year until March. At least I believe that was the case. I don't know if it was late as 1811, but sometimes people would still do the double dates and screw things up. I think that Randolph Lewis probably actually, even though it says in here 11, that was 12. Or, actually, other way around, I still am in a bit of a bind here. Okay. Um, with Lilburn Lewis, because what happens is, is Randolph doesn't mention Lilburn at all. So, you know, but the the death dates are so close, okay, that I really do think that maybe they got these backwards, and this should have been twelve, and that should have been eleven, because otherwise he he wouldn't, you know, not mention his son. Because he mentioned everybody else. And I doubt he was I doubt he was an especially bad guy, but he did have his own trauma. So let's read it's an interesting thing. So let's read this. Okay, so Lilborn Lewis wrote his will uh, April 9th, 1812, died May 18 or the will was proved in May 1812. So in between 
<laughs> the end of May and April 9th, he died. And he mentions as Ligeti's his father, which is Charles Lilburn Lewis, and his three sisters, Martha, Louis, and Lucy, and Nancy. No, Louis. Martha, Lucy, and Nancy. Lilburn is the man who died, or maybe these three shouldn't be here. I'm not sure. They, they repeat names. There is a Mary Lucy. There isn't a Nancy. I still have to sort this out. Maybe, it, you know, and I have to fit in. I got a rough idea when he was born, and then when I find children, I put them in there and fit them in. These all should be estimates of about up until the point Randolph is dead, and I can't have him having children in spaces of time less than nine months. But I know that she would fit in. That means some of the other children have passed away. So to get this to reconcile, <coughs> it's going to be a little difficult. But I know I'm dealing with the right people because they were historically known to have gone to this place. And then he writes a letter on April 9th, the, the day he writes his will. Um, or maybe he he just died, didn't write a will, and these just are the people that are named as his, his legatees. Okay, so it says, Rocky Hill, April 9th, 1812. Mr. James Colley. I have fallen a victim to my beloved but cruel Letitia. Now notice it's not Lucretia, but Letitia. Now, but there's some interesting implications there because Randolph does have a wife, Letitia. And I'll have show one other piece of information that really seals it. Um, I die in hopes of being united to my other wife in heaven. I take care of this will, and she comes here that we may be decently buried. NB, with this enclosure myself and brother request to be interred in the same coffin and same grave. Hmm. Okay. And then Rocky Hill, April 10th, 1812. My beloved but cruel Letitia, receive this as a pledge of my forgiveness to your connection. The day of judgment is to come. I owe you no malice, but die on account of your absence of my dear little son James adieu my love so I've given what's odd about this is that was written the day after he supposedly well wrote his will but he wasn't dead till May so he might have actually died on the 10th it might have been a suicide note unfortunately so I go up here and I give to Lilburn a Letitia and a son James I give him a birth date. I push it all the way to the end. I, I push it to 1811 here. There's a reason why I do that. Because in the 1850 census, there is a 27-year-old James living with Randolph and Lucretia. But I'll tell you that this Lucretia here, if she's 25 years old, certainly ain't the mother of that James. So, um, Letitia versus Lucretia. And, um... But he's only eight years different from Randolph. I always assumed it would be a brother, could be a brother, but um, a, you know, because I don't have the will of Charles Lilburn Lewis, and plus these bro these brothers die before these children of him die before he passes away, so that may not even solve it anyway. Um, but. It's rather convenient that a James without parents shows up, although he is 27. Um, but I'm not gonna. I don't have the benefit of looking at an 1840 census to see a James in a household. But he may be before he's married and so staying in the household. Yeah, he's not married yet. And I'm thinking to myself that this uh, James may be the same person, but his age is a little bit understated there. May not, may so, don't know, it's a possibility. But what I do know is that everything everything works. Um, it's going to be hard to disprove this because there isn't 
no one's going to find anything, to, any any records to really disprove it too much. So it's a, to me, to my mind right now, I, I feel this is a matter of solidifying the findings. And what that's going to take is to go to Livingston County, Tennessee, go in the court records and try to figure out if there's any idea of where Charles Wilburn Lewis actually ended up. I mean, they someone knows he died in 1831. Where that is, I don't know. I'd like to find out. And the one thing that's missing, of course, is Randolph Lewis Sr.'s will, not including his son Randolph. And since he was born in Kentucky, I may just have luck and find a birth record for him. If I find a posthumous birth record, there's no way in hell this would be refuted. So, um, and there's been some on Ancestry, but the problem is um, I'm not going to because I've already looked in Ancestry and there's, there, is, <laughs> there isn't any for in, at least indexed as a Randolph. So, you know, um, I'm gonna, I'll try to look in Livingston County for for those records, but that, that's it. So that's the story. Now, there's a this is a very very big piece of genealogy. Working the way back from this, and this is a pretty compact way to to show a number of generations of Lewis's on one page. And this goes back, although there's a lot of other generations stuffed in between. This goes all the way back to the 1600s. And they're all basically backed up by historical facts and things of that nature. So, let's give you an idea. So, one of the ancestors was a man named um, Augustine Warner. And this is actually his, his um, year range. Uh, you know, born 1610 and died 1674. He built this place called Warner Hall. And it's got some pretty god gosh darn big names attached to it so um, Augustine Warner is actually the great grandfather of George Washington and he's an ancestor of Robert E. Lee Meriwether Lewis and the now Queen of England <laughs> this is the way it looks like you can look up Warner Hall if you want and then he's got his Augustine Warner II. Basically, the Warners married into the Lewis family. There's also a statute on the books, uh, part of the Laws of Virginia. This was passed before, um, of course, before independence. It's got King George stapled all over this thing, but something to do with the way title was passed down. They made they went to Charles Lewis's genealogy and saying that he, the Charles Lewis who had the will, not the Charles Lilburn Lewis, but Charles Lewis, the Charles Lewis Sr. He was the son of a John Lewis, and it just basically sets some kind of legal grounds for passing title from one person to the other and using Charles Lewis as the body <laughs> by which to do so of this little piece of land, and it was part of the laws of Virginia. Now. There was a little bit of trouble. If you look at the Wikipedia page for Charles Lilyburn Lewis, uh, you're going to find that he went out, you know, that he married um, Lucy Jefferson, sister of Peter Jefferson. And I guess there's a little bit of uh, sister of Thomas Jefferson, the president, and daughter of Peter Jefferson. And just as, as a side note, also, just got uh, bonus. Um, Charles Lilburn, and I didn't know any of this stuff before I followed this path, you see. So I didn't, I wasn't motivated by all these different things to, to find a solution, find a reason why these people, you know. Um, and if he didn't have the name Randolph, I wouldn't have gone, gone anywhere. Um, it, it basically mentions that, uh, Charles Lilburn Lewis, was involved along with his father to um, sign Virginia's version of their Declaration of Independence that I think happened actually before uh, the Declaration of Independence went through um, uh, on a 
national level, if you want to call it that. They're all really different. In, they're all in all the different. They're now states were all independent of each other at the time. And, and uh, John Adams had to go in there and raise hell to get everybody to to cooperate and build a coalition. Um, but he had support from the people from Virginia, including William Henry Lee, who actually made the the first motion. But uh, with, with the help of Ben Franklin and Jefferson writing the Declaration, they got the job done. It wasn't easy to do. It took a number of days. It's pretty well. The story's pretty well told on on uh, the John Adams series that was released by HBO. Um, getting back to this. Okay, so what are a little bit of the details that we have about their their lives? Okay, so Lucy Jefferson. Uh, was sister of the president Thomas Jefferson and was the wife of Char Charles Lilburn Lewis. She's born in Al the Morrill County, Virginia, and she was the eighth child of Peter Jefferson and Jean Randolph Jefferson's ten children. Now you notice the name Randolph, and it does point out in the in the genealogy that that not only did Randolph Lewis marry his cousin Mary Howell Lewis. But this Randolph Lewis C. Jr. married. No, I'm wrong. No, Charles Lewis Sr. married Mary Randolph. And then Charles Lilburn Lewis married Lucy Jefferson, who was the daughter of a Randolph. And then Randolph married another Lewis. <laughs> so you get the idea. They're a pretty tightly knit group. Okay. And the couple eventually had eight children. Randolph, um, senior, right? Isham they name, and I haven't seen him yet. In fact, I got other names that aren't in here. Uh, Jane Jefferson, Jefferson being the middle name. Lilburn, Mary Randolph, Randolph being the middle name. Lucy B, Martha, and Ann, Nancy. And Ann ended up marrying a Jefferson, by the way. The family, except for Jean and Mary, moved to Lexington. County, Kentucky in 1806 or 1808. Yeah, that's how I have it. There's two different stories. They built an estate called Rocky Hill near the present day town of Smithland, Tennessee, Kentucky. Uh, Thomas Jefferson took an interest in the education of her sons. However, her sons... Now, where it says Thomas Jefferson took an interest in the education of her sons, I would really like to see that. And I've gone to um, the Monticello website I have found close to no, none, of any kind of um, scanned original documents up there. Whereas you, you can you can go and you can look at some of the original documents that Ben Franklin and Tom and John Adams had written online. You can find repositories and actually read those accounts um, firsthand rather than a transcription. But they're putting transcriptions up at the Monticello site. But um, I would rather see originals, frankly. And, and there's a pretty good repository at the University of Virginia. I just didn't have time to go in and look there. And I don't know if they're, they're housed there, if they're housed in the Library of Congress, if they're spread about. I don't know. But, you know, logic tells me <laughs> that, you know, Jefferson would have wanted to have some correspondence with his sister. By the account from the old Kentucky story, it sounds like she never got any, but that may not exactly be true. And hopefully, in some of those accounts, I'm, I'm hoping to find um, just names of sons and daughters come up here and there, and perhaps even grandkids if, if he lived long enough. I, I don't know. Um, but there is one story in here. I guess it's going to be mentioned in Wikipedia when I go to the the article that someone else wrote on Charles Lilburn Lewis. Um, you know, I'll get to that when we get there. Well, it's going to mention here. Thomas Jefferson took an education of her sons. However, her sons Lilburn and Isham Lewis brutally murdered a slave, which brought the entire family into disrepute when the murder came to light because of the collapse of, of a chimney during the second New Madrid earthquake. God. President Jefferson had two children, Lucy Elizabeth Jefferson and Lucy Elizabeth Jefferson II, named after his sisters Lucy and Elizabeth. 
and then she died. She's bur buried on the grounds of the estate. And, but the estate is now in ruins and her grave is lost. Well, they put a marker up for the, uh, by the Daughters of the American Revolution, but they don't know exactly where she was buried. In Livingston County, a monument honoring Lucy Jefferson Lewis was erected by the Daughters of the American Revolution the intersection of U.S. Highway 60 and Kentucky State Route 137. A few miles south of the monument, a bridge named in her honor, Lucy Jefferson Lewis Memorial Bridge, spans the Cumberland River on U.S. Highway 60 at <coughs> Smithland. An obelisk in her memory is placed in the Rocky Hill Cemetery by the local chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution, which was called the Lucy Jefferson Lewis Chapter. And that's it. Yeah, and then there's another article on, on Slave George. This is a picture of the monument. And I guess they have the same death date that I do, just simply 1811, because they don't know anymore. Then this was on the Monte Monticello site, and it says that um, there's <coughs> some runaway slave called called Sandy that was. Ah, oh, here we go. Thomas Jefferson's account books tell us that he bought things like grass seed and venison from Sandy. The account books also tell us that Thomas Jefferson sold Sandy to Charles Lewis. That's Charles Lilburn Lewis. Charles Lewis was an uncle of Thomas Jefferson's wife, Martha. Or maybe it was, maybe actually it's not this Charles Lilburn, but this Charles. Yes, he's married to Mary Randolph. And Mary's, I think, sister was mother to Thomas Jefferson. Kind of gives you some. Unfortunately, they they, they had slaves, but the Adams wouldn't have done that in a million years. Here are some of the Warner and Lewis grave. This is the site of some of the Warner and Lewis graves that have faded so far <coughs> beyond recognition. They they try to maintain as much as they can, but a lot of the <coughs> what what used to read on the tops of those are no longer visible by one account, at least by the writer of the Lewis genealogy. And so, um, now, how did Randolph Lewis end up in, Tennessee, in Smith County, Tennessee? Well, we do know that the folks in Virginia don't know what happened to Randolph. We know that the folks in Kentucky don't seem to know what happened to Randolph either. Uh, there's just a, a barren lot and that's it. Well, uh, DeKalb County, the, the uh, Smith County, Tennessee is pretty pretty remote, which became DeKalb County, uh, where uh, the Starnes family lived and where the um, Luce, uh, Luce family ended up going. And that's where Monroe Lewis Murray, you know, met Anna Starnes, and you know, they both ended up coming down to Kentucky together. And then they got married there, but both families came down together. And um, <clears throat> I wouldn't know why they went up there. I just know that that's the only place a Randolph shows up. And he shows up there as early, actually, as 1810. I think I may have already shown that. Now, going through these senses and trying to work forward is another small subject to cover. I'll tell you, these censuses are so poor, it's hardly worth the effort. The 1810 census is in good condition. And here we've got a Lilburn, a Charles L., and a Randolph all living in Smithland, very nicely placed. And, you know, I could place people, and the writing was at least big enough for the scan wasn't poor enough that I was able to, you know, the, the indexers were able to read it, and I was able to come up with an answer. And there's there's Lilburn and you know they don't know they don't have a complete record of all the kids because they were out there in Livingston County, Kentucky, and I really wonder if there's anything in the county records that might help bring a clearer picture as to what happened. So, for example, I really can't clearly connect this John Lewis who was born sometime between 1785 and 94 
to this family, but that they were, but they was living in Smithland, I could probably draw the conclusion that uh, they were related. But I, you know, it's only probably, you know, <laughs> this Hugh Lewis. I wonder if it was if this is Howell. But when I looked at the other records, I could. I had a place to put Hal with all the children that were indicated there, so and he seems a bit old to be Hal, so he would have had to been uh, maybe a brother to Charles Lilburn, if anything. Um, but I again don't know enough, don't have enough records. I you know my main focus was to get back to those other things. This I thought before I had seen the will, that maybe this Lil question, 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 Lewis in Salem, Livingston County, that's what the, uh, is a place close by, and sometimes the census takers just put the name of the biggest place, and they don't bother calling the next one Rocky Hill, or Smith, Smithland, or whatever they called it, and so, but still there's only two, so we went from the presence of one, two, three, four, five, six Lewises, and there's no other L-O-U-I-S is there, or anything like that. So how did it get so sparse in 1820? Well, that's because the records are just so poor. I mean, you can, uh, this, it's just, even if you look up close, everything's smudged and unreadable as far as names are concerned. They appear to be in alphabetical order, but you just can't really make out if there's a Lewis there or not. And then Smith, Tennessee, the first Lewis to show up was a Benjamin Lewis. I again, I don't know his connection. He probably was one of the several children of of um, Charles Lilborn here. Probably, yeah, he probably had more children than that. I just don't know about them all because they were born in Smithland or died in Smithland or whatever, <laughs> you know. Now, ultimately, what I'm saying here though is that I've got very, very good circumstantial evidence, but at the end of the day, I don't have what I call sufficient competent evidence. I don't have a historical account written by someone that doesn't care whether Randolph Lewis lands in the as a descendant of Charles Lilburn or Randolph Jr. lands as a descendant of Randolph Lewis, but just writes a historical account based on records and some um, county repositories, if they exist, uh, about this family and and states as historical fact that that's what had happened. Again, the Lewis family had a, a motivation to find the ancestors and descendants and, and put them in a book, although they do say that they were conscientious and you know, two sep three separate works are including both Randolphs, and so it's hard to doubt that that's what happened. I, I just myself don't have access to those records. But based on the evidence that I've seen, I only think that there's, uh, by a thread, maybe limited assurance on this. Um, and that's only because, well, there aren't any other Randolph... Uh, the main point is there aren't any other Randolph Lewises to account for this, and, and someone's vouching for them, right? But it doesn't mean it's the vouching's right, or the, they're the same Randolph Lewises in exact fact, and in those days, in uh, you know, it says that the wife of the President of the United States was buried in a hill with a rock that had no marker. Well, that's the way the times were back then in uh, the early 1800s in in Livingston County, Kentucky. They didn't. There wasn't many people there, and so they didn't have a guy to make gravestones. They probably didn't have a county recorder, but maybe the county may have been... At one time, the entire state of Kentucky, except for all the land that's west of the Tennessee River, which encompasses six counties, was one county before of Virginia. <laughs> so, um, go figure as to, you know, how... Although Kentucky did get its statehood rather early... It is listed as a state at least as early as 1810. It was still, it, it was that was that was the West. That was the place where people went and populated, where no one had been before, where civilization hadn't completely established itself. It certainly wasn't Virginia, <laughs> it, it's, as established as Virginia had been at the time, with all the 
commerce and trade. You know, it was, it was definitely these were pioneers, and so you know, unless some old dusty family Bible is going to service itself from someone's attic somewhere in Tennessee, it's we're not going to find the birth, death, and marriage records for these people, and so it's a matter really of of history. And a matter of well, this is how we know that Charles Lilburn Lewis had gone out here because Jefferson wrote him to want to know how his children Randolph, Martha, Lucy, Nancy, and, and Lilburn Lil were doing, you know, um, or the, the police account of the death of the, the slave, or you know, different things like that are, are the only things that really you can go on at this point. Uh, things are really of a matter of history. So um, that's the situation there. And unfortunately, the census records, even if you try to reconstruct what had happened, um, on some of these branches working our way down from Charles Lilburn and Lewis, we're going to see that there's a number in a column that we don't have a name for in many cases because we don't have that many names in our genealogy book no records have survived. So there are Lewises around there that are descendants of these people that are not going to ever be able to make a connection because there's the record stops here. They, they were you know in an area uh, that didn't have you know a, a full-fledged government yet to write down names in a ledger. You know and in fact Kentucky didn't really have death certificates until 1911. They had death registers probably starting from 1850, and you know we're in, a, and that's in the Kraken County uh, that I know of, and then here we are in 1810. You know, there were some parts of, and just to keep elaborating, there's some parts of the parts of Tennessee from which these people moved to didn't have didn't have a church for a number of years, and so their yards, uh, the sides of hills, their front yard was actually their graveyard. I'm going to stop here, but I think I've presented a pretty good case. And so now it's just a matter for me to go back, work my way back, Randolph Lewis, and get all the ancestors in that are in these genealogies, and they're pretty extensive, and they go back to the 1600s, and that's, that's great. And hey, guess what? Uh, Ancestry.com now has transcribed church records uh, going back to 1500s, so we may be able to get quite far with this line. Uh, falls good, and it sounds like these people weren't uh, unknowns. They, they were generals and things of the British Army, so we're probably going to get back quite a ways. I'll stop here, and hope that was helpful, but I think I have a new find, and that find is, is that the, the Lewis family, the Monroe Lewis family, they ended up in McCracken, Kentucky. All the evidence that I have, which is very limited, points exactly to the answer that uh, they're descendants of uh, Peter Jefferson by his daughter Lucy Jefferson, and there is a relationship to Meriwether Lewis from the Lewis Clark expedition, and there is a um, yeah connection between both those families and even the um, this large family whose name now forgets me, um, the Warner family that built Warner Hall. <laughs>